Talo Falava and Maloy Lele. Uh, I would like to call for a start to our webinar today. Uh, a special welcome to our distinguished members who are joining us online, our member countries, our peer crop and UN agencies, our partners, academia, colleagues and friends. Thank you very much for joining us today. A uh, special acknowledgement to the representatives of our host government, the government of Samoa. Uh, thank you, Madam Francis Rupena, CEO for Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources for gracing us today uh, here in person at the center. Uh, members of the diplomatic call uh, who are joining us today, uh, I would also like to welcome our partner institution hosting this webinar, the Australian National uh, University. Uh, also a warm welcome to our distinguished panelists uh, from around the Pacific, but also uh, here at SPREP and representatives of non-government organizations, researchers and universities, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and friends. A warm greetings and talo falava from the Pacific Climate Change Center uh, hosted at the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program or otherwise known as PREP. It is a pleasure to receive you here today in person and virtually for the first Pacific webinar on intercommunal uh, panel on climate change, working group one, six assessment report. Uh, without further ado, and as usual in our Pacific way, we will start our program with a word of prayer. And I would like to invite Mr. Chope Tavetanivalu, acting director for environmental monitoring and governance of SPREP to um, start our webinar today with a word of prayer. Thank you, Chope. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mofa Kaisami. And uh, may I kindly uh, request all of us to bow our head and close our eyes in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Mendesa Masu, Ichovana Tamaiki Mami, Volo Malangi, Me Boka Rokoroko Tagisalatigo Nayadamuni, Me Adosalatinga Nanomuni Lewa, Me Adosalatinga Nalomamuni Eburubura, Me Boka Sadagatigo Melo Malangi. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, the creator of heaven and earth. We are thankful for this opportunity to come together and fellowship on a topic that is important to the region. The impact of climate change to the environment and our people. Thank you, dear Lord, for the seven year assessment report that state the condition of our climate. This has uh, prompted the leaders and decision makers and practitioners to come together and deliberate and strategize on the actions that will lead to our safeguard. Dear Lord, I uplift the program to you, the speakers and all the activities that will be involved. We ask and seek for your blessings. Thank you to dear Lord for the leaders who will be delivering opening remarks and keynote address. Let their message be a beacon of light and hope towards our fight or combat towards climate change. Thank you to dear Lord for your Holy Spirit that will continue to guide us and give us wisdom. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we fall short of your glory. Please forgive us of our sins. This is our prayer, dear Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And thank you, uh, uh, Chope, uh, for the prayer and for blessing the program today. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, I would now like to call and invite the um, Director General of SPREP, uh, Leota Kosilatu, uh, for his welcoming remarks. Uh, you have the floor, Director General. Thank you very much, uh, Ofa and uh, Talofa. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, can I acknowledge all of our member countries who are joining us this afternoon? I'd like to acknowledge the Chief Executive Officer of uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment uh, of the Government of Samoa and Officials, distinguished panelists, uh, members of the diplomatic crop partners, uh, UN family representatives, uh, our partners, um, 
NGO representatives and uh, our partner co and our co-host, uh, ANU, <coughs> uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this um, intergovernmental panel on climate change on the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. I'd like to acknowledge uh, all of you who uh, make the effort uh, to join us virtually. Um, we all know that COVID-19 has impacted not just the Pacific, but the whole world. We have seen the impacts of that day in and day out. Uh, we also know it's uh, created a new norm of operation for all of us here in the Pacific, and uh, in this case, for the Pacific Climate Change Center here at SPREP. Um, the, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, in that report, the seven yearly assessment report, um, focuses on the physical science of climate change covering Pacific climate, climate phenomena, including temperature rise, rainfall, marine, heat waves, tropical cyclones, sea level rise, ocean acidity, and coastal flooding. The report, the IPCC reports are the world's most authoritative sources of climate change, which, is a, which have been approved by um, 195 countries. I am pleased to inform you all that the webinar today uh, will have the opportunity to take a deep dive into the main findings of the report and what it means for us here in the Pacific. <clears throat> As you know, our Pacific leaders have consistently said in many of their meetings that climate change is the biggest threat uh, to our survival and to our livelihoods here in the region. And when we look at the IPCC report, the recent one that we are going to be talking about this afternoon, it is very clear the message that we, uh, we receive from this report is very clear, it's very obvious that urgent changes must be made to limit global warming to the Paris Agreement's 1.5 Celsius temperature limit while there is time. For us in the Pacific region, the report outlines and spells out alarming consequences starting with us first. In the world, sorry, if the world fails to listen to the warnings in this report. I might add that this is not the first IPCC report that is, uh, gives such warnings. This is one in a series of many reports that we have seen in the past several years. We also know that we only contribute uh, less than 1% to the world's total greenhouse gases, but we are at the front line and we are amongst the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So according to the RA, RA6 Working Group 1 report, widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, the ocean, the cryosphere and bio biosphere have occurred. The world has already warmed by 1.1 degrees Celsius due to human interventions or human made climate change, which has seen sea levels already rise by 20 centimeters and will continue to do so for thousands and thousands of years to come. It is obvious to us that if we can limit global warming to 1.5 Celsius degree Celsius, we will avoid at least three meters of sea level rise. We are feeling the impacts of climate change here in the region and is only gonna get worse according to this report. I think the message for us is very clear and that is we must act and we must act now. For small island, islands developing states, the report confirms that we are already experiencing the most intense tropical cyclones and are increasing in intensity and will continue to do so. We only have to look back in the last three, four years in terms of the impact of tropical cyclones here in the region. Um, as coordinator for climate change action in the region, SPREP continues to lead the region's response to climate impacts. As the host of the Pacific Climate Change Center, SPREP is committed and will continue to deliver on its mandate uh, as coordinator of Pacific Climate Change Action. 
We will, of course, do this in close collaboration and in partnership with all of our partners, including our member countries. I would like to uh, acknowledge the partnership with um, Australian National University, ANU. I would like to thank uh, all of our colleagues from ANU for the support and, of course, um, co-hosting this uh, web, uh, webinar with us. Uh, we look forward to our partnership with ANU in the future. But for today, I wanted to acknowledge um, your, your inputs and your contributions. Um, I'd like to acknowledge especially the presence of uh, Professor Mark Howden, who is the Vice Chair of the Working Group 2 of this IPCC report. And uh, let, me, uh, let me conclude by saying that, um, of course, we, we'd like to thank and acknowledge the partnerships that we have with all of our member countries. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge our host government, government of Samoa for the support that we have received through the Pacific Climate Change Center and also the governments of Japan and New Zealand, and also the Irish government for the funding support that has been provided to the Climate Change Center. With those uh, few words, uh, let me thank you once again for making time to join us. I wish you all the best, and I'm looking forward to this webinar this afternoon. Thank you. Director General for your remarks and messages. Uh, I would like to now invite the Chief Executive Officer of the Samoa Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, Madame uh, Francis Rupena, to please deliver the keynote remarks for our webinar. Thank you. Director General of SPREP, members of the Diplomatic Corps, were able to join us uh, today. Partner NGOs, institutions and universities, distinguished participants. It is a great privilege to be here on behalf of the government of Samoa and Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Environment, Afiong Afiyame Naomi Mata Afa. Greetings and talo falaba. It is indeed a great opportunity to provide keynote remarks for the Pacific webinar for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. IPCC Working Group 1 6 Assessment Report, or AR6. At the outset, I would like to highlight the urgency of the IPCC report to enhance ambition for countries to respond to the detrimental impacts of climate change, especially in the most vulnerable. As a small island state, we are at the front line of climate change impacts. We have experienced firsthand some of the worst and devastating effects in our social, environmental, and economic sectors, to name a few. We reiterate that this is a global problem requiring urgent, immediate, and a sustained global response. The Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change indicates that urgent and transformative action is necessary to keep global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius or below in order to adapt to global threats and to achieve our agreed sustainable development goals. Under the Paris Agreement, countries in the world agree to work towards global goals that would limit global average temperature rise. The timely release of this report is important to signal to the international community that we can no longer ignore the devastating impact of climate change. The Pacific Climate Change Center, which is a regional center of excellence for climate change information, research, capacity building and innovation hosted at SPREP is a partnership between the governments of Japan and Samoa. It is funded under grants aid through the Japan International Cooperation Agency through Samoa as the host country of SPREP. The center was officially opened in 2019 and will continue to deliver capacity development programs in adaptation, mitigation, climate services, and project development, and at the same time, promote and foster applied research, drive innovation, and build capacity in these areas. The Pacific Island leaders have reaffirmed that climate change represents the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security, and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific. 
They are concerned that the impact of natural disasters exacerbated by climate change on Pacific peoples, social, economic, cultural, and environmental well-being is increasingly is increasing greatly the burden and risk to the region's security. Samoa's enhanced climate change actions indicate our commitment to be part of the solution despite our insignificant greenhouse gas emissions. In response to this call to action and from a country perspective, Samoa's National Climate Change Policy 2020 to 2030 was developed as part of Samoa's whole of government response. The policy will ensure there is effective and coordinated implementation of our climate change obligations at all levels. The policy provides the baseline for the evolution of national adaptation and mitigation targets, complements prevailing climate activities, and promotes a multidisciplinary and complementary approach, building upon relevant existing plans and programs including our various plans, community integrated management plans, and nationally determined contributions. We take note that the IPCC report has continued to highlight the urgency for countries to take strong climate actions to increase resilience and protect livelihoods from impacts of climate change. We look forward to continuing our partnership with SPREP and the PCC to implement practical solutions and actions to combat climate change and increase the resilience of our Pacific people and communities. Thank you and God bless. Of Tailava, Madam CEO, uh, your remarks is well received and much appreciated. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have concluded the formalities and I would uh, I'd now I'd like to move to the next agenda item in our program, which is the lecture summary of the IPCC Physical Science Report by Professor Mark Howden. Uh, before we go into uh, Howden's uh, presentation, I would just like to give a brief background information uh, to um, Professor Mark Howden. Uh, he is a vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the director of the Institute of Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University. Howden has been a major contrib contributor to the IPCC since 1991, with roles in the second, third, fourth, fifth, and now the sixth assessment report. He shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with other IPCC participants and Alcor. He helped develop both the national and international greenhouse gas inventories that a fundamental part of the Paris Agreement has assessed sustainable ways to reduce emissions. Mark has worked on climate variability, climate change, innovation and adaptation issues for over 30 years in partnership with many industries, community and policy groups via both research and science policy roles. Issues that Mark has addressed include agriculture and food security, natural resources space, ecosystems and biodiversity, energy, water, and urban systems. I will now invite Professor Mark Howden to please deliver your presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Oops, we've got a bit of feedback there, I think. Okay, um, so th thank you very much uh, for that introduction and, uh, and also to the wonderful introductory comments from the Director General of SPREP and, and also from Francis Rupena. Um, and I'd particularly like to acknowledge the fantastic cooperation we've had with SPREP uh, in terms of developing this presentation uh, and we look forward to continuing the work with them. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge um, my co-panelists uh, today. Um, so Arona Nagari, who has been a, a fantastic, uh, had a fantastic input from the government perspective into these reports. Um, Morgan Wairu, who's a convening lead author in Working Group 2, and Michael Gross, who's a lead author in this Working Group 1 report on the climate science. And before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm standing today, uh, which is the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So just to start the, um, 
the presentation. I'll just flip to my screen. It should be coming up um, with a full screen there. Is that right? Just looking for some acknowledgement that that screen is showing. Yvette? Thank you. Well, good. Okay. So, so today what I'm just going to cover is um, the, the, the focus on the Working Group 1 report, uh, which is very much addressing the climate science uh, in relation to climate change. Um, but also noting uh, that in this presentation, uh, I'll be uh, reflecting on that we've developed uh, in tandem with SPREP um, some fact sheets uh, relating to this report. And so the, the URL for those fact sheets is down the bottom here, and that will also come up in various slides in this presentation. Um, and, and of course, uh, in this presentation, I'd just like to um, very much acknowledge uh, the um, fantastic work uh, right across Working Group One, who's pulled together an enormous amount of information here. So just putting this in context, um, this is one of many reports across this IPCC cycle. So we started off with the 1.5 degrees report, the special report on 1.5 degrees. Uh, in the same cycle, we've actually had a report on the oceans and cryosphere. The cryosphere is the ice covered areas of the world. Uh, also a report on climate change and land uh, and emissions inventory report. And now this report, the first of the three main assessment reports on the climate science. This will be followed by another report scheduled in February of next year on the impacts and adaptation of these climate changes. And then followed in March of next year by a report which looks at how we can move on to trajectories to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions so we go into desirable futures. And then in September of next year, around this time next year, there's a synthesis report which pulls all of this together. So this is the full cycle. This report is one part of that full cycle. And as I indicate here, um, what we have is linkages between this Working Group 1 report and also Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 and the synthesis report. And in terms of this Working Group 1 report, there's three main parts plus the interactive atlas, and Michael Gross was part of that interactive atlas team. But effectively, the uh, report is organised into three main sections. One is large-scale information dealing with things like the changing state of the climate system. Secondly, is a series of chapters on understanding the processes of climate change and ocean change. And then the third main component is dealing with regional information. So linking global to regional climate and providing climate information for risk assessment. Right across that, a huge amount of information and expertise has actually been collated in this report. So this report has more than 14,000 scientific papers referenced in there. It had more than 78,000 reviewers' comments on this report, each of which has to be dealt with by the reviewers, and there's a QA process to ensure that those comments are dealt with appropriately. And this has been pulled together by 234 authors from 65 countries across the globe. Unfortunately, relatively few of those authors were from the Pacific, and I think increasingly in the future, we'll need to have much better representation from the Pacific, not only in the author teams, not only from governments having input into the scoping of the uh, reports, but also the review of these reports, but also in terms of generating the underlying science that is represented and synthesized in these reports. So a key message here is please engage with the IPCC. The IPCC is the biggest science entity globally that deals with climate change. It's the process which actually generates an agreed version of climate change and a summary of that between the governments of the world and the science community. It's a really important process to engage in. So what has that process said? Firstly, it shows with very strong clarity that recent changes in the climate are widespread, they're rapid, they're intensifying, and they're unprecedented in many thousands and sometimes millions of years. It shows 
how our temperatures across the globe are increasing. So the panel of the right on the right shows how these temperatures have gone up since pre-industrial times, 1850 to 1900, and they're going up and up faster and faster over time. Essentially, the last decade was 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer. Last year was 1.24 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial average. If we look at that in a longer term context, going back 2000 years using data such as tree ring data and similar paleo information, we can see that this warming that we're experiencing is unprecedented in that 2000 years. It's way outside the envelope of past variation in temperature across the globe. So it's very clear that the warming is happening, but it's not just the warming. So if we look at carbon dioxide concentrations, right now it's 40, 417 parts per million. When I was born, it was 317 parts per million. It's gone up 100 parts per million in my lifetime. And it's higher than it has been for the last 2 million years. If we look at sea level rise, we've seen the fastest rates in at least 3,000 years. If we look at Arctic sea ice, it's the lowest level in at least 1,000 years. And if we look at the melting glaciers across the globe, that melt is unprecedented in at least 2,000 years. So we're going into uncharted territory more and more associated with climate change. And it's very, very clear now that human activities are causing that change. In fact, this report makes the statement that it is unequivocal that there is now no uncertainty left, that it is an established fact that humans are causing the warming that we're seeing. And it's increasingly clear that that warming is making extreme climate events, including heat waves, rainfall, droughts, more frequent and more severe. So in terms of the human influence on climate change, this is one of the key graphs that comes from the report. What this shows is the best estimate of natural variation in global temperatures, the best estimate of the combination of natural variation and human influence, and then the observed temperature changes across the globe. And we can see that looking at that natural variation, that essentially it's flatlining. It's not going up particularly or down particularly. It does vary because of effects such as uh, solar radiation variations, and also volcanoes. So volcanoes, when they occur, put very significant amounts of particulates high in the atmosphere where they can reflect some of the sunlight which cools the world. So we see a very sharp drop in temperatures when those volcanoes, a big volcano happens, but as those particles settle out, the temperature goes back to where it would otherwise have been. But if we look at the influence, the added influence of humans, we see a clear separation between the natural variation and that component that includes the human influence. And this is why the human influence is now unequivocal. It is clear. And we can see that, that combination of human and natural closely corresponds with the observed temperature increases. If we look at what's driving that, what we see is it's a combination of both warming and cooling influences from humans. So if we look at the left-hand panel, where it says observed warming, we've seen a little bit over one degrees on a, an average basis. And on the right-hand panel, we can see the total human influence essentially is responsible for all of that. But we can see that the greenhouse gas component of warming is actually quite significantly bigger, around about 1.5 degrees. But this is offset by significant reductions due to aerosol cooling. And we can also see that the natural factors are essentially zero. It's not pushing temperatures up particularly, nor down particularly. These are things like the volcanoes. And if we look at internal variability, such as decadal variation, again, it's essentially zero. So clearly, most of the net influence in terms of warming is due to humans. And that's a component of both greenhouse gas emissions 
and aerosols, one warms and one cools. And most of those greenhouse gas emissions are carbon dioxide, followed by a significant component from methane <clears throat> and then nitrous oxide and various other gases. If we look at what impact that's having on extremes, we can see more frequent and more intense extreme heat. Rainfall, heavy rainfall is becoming more frequent, more intense, and we see an increased proportion of in severe cyclones, the category three, four, and five cyclones. Drought has increased in some regions. Fire weather has become more frequent. And oceans are warming, they're acidifying, and also they're losing oxygen. The report states very clearly on the basis of different scenarios that there are immediate, rapid, and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions if we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And recalling that 1.5 degrees was the target that was fought so hard for by Pacific nations in the Paris Agreement. So what does the report say about that in terms of different scenarios? So these are different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions, ranging from the very high down to the very low, with three different intermediate emission scenarios. Now I've put against that essentially the temperatures that would be achieved under those different emission scenarios by the end of the century. So if we go on the very high trajectory, we end up with a global temperature of something like five degrees, possibly even more, 5.7 is the upper limit. If we go on emissions trajectories, which are very low, that are consistent with the Paris Agreement, we head towards two degrees or 1.5 degrees. And I've put against these different temperatures essentially where we're tracking at the moment. At the moment, our current trajectory in terms of greenhouse gas emissions is pretty consistent with something like a little bit less than four degrees and a bit above three degrees. And that's because not all countries are meeting their Paris Agreement commitments. If all countries met their Paris Agreement commitments, then we'd be heading towards a temperature of something like three degrees. But to actually meet the Paris Agreement temperature goals, which are well below two degrees and if possible to 1.5 degrees, we have to go on the low or very low scenarios. And importantly, you'll notice that both of those have net zero times, about 2050 for the very low scenario and 2070 for the low scenario. And both of them go below the line. Both of them have to have negative emissions to actually keep temperatures down to 1.5 degrees or two degrees. If we look at the same sort of information, but in terms of temperature increase, there's a couple of points that I want to make in relation to this. Firstly, under all of the scenarios, at the moment, we're likely to exceed 1.5 degrees in the next decade, in the 2030s. And we're likely to exceed that under the high emission scenarios earlier and possibly even this decade in the 2020s. The good news of this is that if we actually do stick to the 1.5 degrees, the very low scenario, it has us temporarily exceeding 1.5 degrees around about 2050 and then starting to come down. And the key message here is that if we go onto that trajectory, we can start to turn climate change around and start to recover lost ground. Next, climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways, and the information base for this is enormous now. But the changes that we experience will increase with further warming. So those oftentimes the changes we've already experienced will just continue and possibly accelerate under those high emission scenarios. So what does this look like? So this is a, a three graphs of temperature variation across the globe at 1.5, 2 or 4 degrees. And we can see that everywhere warms, but some places warm faster than others. And so particularly in the northern latitudes and the very southern latitudes, we see very quick rapid warming. But we also see less warming across the oceans of the world than on the land base. The oceans take a lot more energy to warm up 
uh, because of the nature of water, it takes a, a lot more energy to heat up water than it does to heat up soil. But also because oceans can bury temperature increases down into the deep ocean, so it's not stuck at the surface. And importantly, many small islands, they're predominantly, temp temperature is predominantly influenced by the temperature of the surrounding oceans. And so many of the small islands will actually have lower temperature increases than other parts of the globe, other land areas of the globe. If we look at what this particularly means though for the oceans, it's not just about the averages, but it's also about the extremes. And marine heat waves are a critical part of this. So in these three uh, figures, we can see that the observed marine heat waves are already, already starting to increase. We've seen significant increases in those compared with the pre-industrial. But these increases are relatively minor compared with what might happen even under, under a low emission scenario, but much, much less than what might happen under a very high emission scenario. So under that very high emission scenario, we could actually see a many, many fold increase in marine heat wave frequency and in many, many more days in locations under marine heat wave conditions. So up to the tune of 200 days a year under those high emission scenarios. And again, just noting that much of this information is covered in those fact sheets um, that ANU and SPREP have prepared for you. So they're easy to understand, very well laid out. If we look at what might happen with rainfall, um, it's intensely spatially variable. So again, rainfall changes at 1.5, 2 and 4 degrees. Uh, and what we can see, the patterns of change are very similar across those temperature changes, but the intensity just increases more and more as we go into the higher temperature changes. And in particular, if we look at the Pacific area, we can see that that band around the equator is likely to get significantly increased rainfall, but that band in the subtropics is likely to have decreased rainfall. And even in those areas which have increased rainfall, we still might have drying conditions because increased potential evaporation associated with warmer air and drier air which may occur across the globe. We also see in these analyses intensification of the subtropical ridge, that's the area of high pressure that occurs uh, in different latitudes and also changes to the South Pacific Convergence Zone and Michael Gross will discuss this in his presentation. So we're likely to see changes in the water cycle and water availability across the Pacific. We're also likely to see changes in cyclones. So we're already starting to see the signals of this. Across the Pacific, overall, as the projections are to face fewer but more intense tropical cyclones under all emission scenarios. But there may be more frequent cyclones in the subtropical central Pacific even though on average, the Pacific Basin may reduce. There's very strong indications that proportionately more of the cyclones that occur are going to be the severe ones, the category three, four, and five cyclones. And of course, cyclones come on top of sea level rise, significantly increasing storm surge risk across the coasts of many islands. And also rainfall intensity both in the cyclones and in other storms is likely to increase, potentially doubling up to four degrees. So rainfall intensity is what drives floods and also what drives erosion of soil from productive agricultural land. And we also see potentially some polewards movement or extension of cyclonic activity, particularly in the Western North Pacific. So areas that used not to get affected by cyclones may get affected in the future. Another key driver of climate across the Pacific is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or otherwise known as ENSO. And it's virtually certain that ENSO will remain the key source of interannual variability of climate across the Pacific. But ENSO is likely to strengthen and shift eastwards with climate change. And importantly, the variability of rainfall around ENSO is likely to increase. 
So particularly under the intermediate to very high scenarios, and particularly in the second half of this century. So essentially that's saying the wet years will get wetter and the dry years will get drier. So there's increased variation associated with ENSO. So increased flood risk, but at the same time, potentially increased drought risk. If we look at what might happen to sea level rise, so these are up, essentially updates of the scenarios coming out of the IPCC Oceans Report. And again, displayed against the different emission scenarios. But what we're seeing in terms of sea level rise, we're already seeing acceleration. So for example, if we look back in the last century over that 70 years, that sea level rise averaged about 1.3 millimetres per year. And recently, it's averaged about 3.7 millimetres per year. And in recent years, it's higher than that. So we're seeing an acceleration already of sea level rise. And that acceleration is likely to continue. So if we look at the scenarios towards the end of this century, we see that if we stick to a low emission scenario, roughly speaking, sea level rise will be around the half a metre mark. If we go to a high emission scenario, it's closer to a metre. But really importantly, what this report showed was there are low probability but high consequence scenarios associated with things like breakdown of the Greenland ice sheet and breakdown of the Antarctic ice sheets which could generate much higher sea level rises. So for example, one and three quarter meters by the end of this century, and this report stated explicitly, they couldn't rule out five meters of sea level rise by 2150. These are really serious concerns. If we look at other changes in the oceans, so every tonne of carbon dioxide we produce, some of that gets absorbed by the oceans. And in the process of being absorbed, it acidifies the oceans, it makes them less alkaline. So if you think about, if you open a bottle of mineral water, it has a bit of a zing on the tongue. And that's because the carbon dioxide dissolved in that water, the bubbles in the soft drink or the water, form carbonic acid. And the more carbon dioxide you have, the stronger that acid is. So under these scenarios of increased carbon dioxide emissions, we get more and more carbon dioxide absorbed by the oceans and they become more and more acidic. Their alkalinity drops. We can see that it's already dropping, but under the very high scenarios, that tends to actually increase the rate of reduction in pH with really profound implications for the biology of things like coral reefs. If we go on a low emission scenario, however, we start to bottom out that pH and we start to get a gradual recovery. So again, the message is if we manage greenhouse gas emissions, we can start to turn this around a bit. And importantly, the amount of carbon dioxide and the degree of impacts in terms of our ocean systems is very much dependent on those greenhouse gas emission scenarios. So what this particular figure shows is the proportion of carbon dioxide that's emitted under those different scenarios, which is absorbed by the land and the ocean. In the land, it's things like trees and grass and soils. And under a low emission scenario, something like 70% of those emissions will be absorbed by those natural processes, leaving about 30% in the air. And that will stay in the air for hundreds and even thousands of years. But in contrast, if we go to a high emission scenario, it's almost entirely flipped. So only about 38% of those emissions will be absorbed by the land and the ocean, which means 62% will remain in the atmosphere, accumulating over time and causing future climate change. And of course, as we have that bigger proportion of uh, emissions uh, which are being absorbed, um, uh, the larger amounts of emissions, that acidifies the oceans and causes the problems, whereas the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes the climate change. Now, the last part of this presentation is just reinforcing that the climate we experience in the future depends on the decisions we make now. 
part of the story about urgency here is in the basis of the exceedance of 1.5 degrees and how quick that may happen. But part of that story of urgency from this report is related to how quickly we exceed our carbon budgets. Now, the carbon budget idea arises because there's almost a linear, a straight line relationship between accumulated carbon dioxide emissions, so these are adding up the emissions over time, and global temperature change. And this graph shows those accumulated carbon dioxide and temperature changes up to the year 2050 for different emission scenarios going from the low or the very low in the blue to the high. And we can see that linear relationship, the straight line relationship. And the importance of that is we can actually say for any given temperature target, like two degrees, there's an amount of carbon dioxide that cumulatively we can emit and still stay below that temperature target. And when you summarise or simplify this, what it shows is relatively simply that for every trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide, we push up global temperatures by about 0.45 degrees with some uncertainty around that. And so there's this very, very straightforward linkage between emissions and temperature change. And that gives us the ability to construct what we call a carbon budget with different probabilities of achievement. So this is a, a table that came out of the IPCC, and this is my last slide. Um, and what it shows is for different temperature targets, like 1.5 degrees or two degrees, which are highlighted in orange and red, there's different amounts of carbon dioxide that we can emit and still be consistent with achieving that target. So for example, what I've highlighted over to the right is that for a two thirds chance, a 67% chance of staying within 1.5 degrees, we can emit another 400 gigatons of carbon dioxide. For a two thirds chance of staying within two degrees, we can emit 1150 gigatons, billion tons of carbon dioxide. Now that might sound a large amount, but unfortunately at the moment, or at least pre-COVID, we were emitting around about 42 billion tons of carbon dioxide a year. And at that rate, our carbon budget that's consistent with 1.5 degrees disappears very, very quickly. That's part of the message of urgency. Globally, we need to start reducing greenhouse gas emissions now. So the three key messages from this report about achieving emission reductions and limiting climate change is really quite straightforward. Firstly, we need to stay within a carbon budget for any given temperature change, 1.5 or two degrees. We need to manage our emissions to stay within that budget. Secondly, we need to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions to stop the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and ongoing climate change. And thirdly, we need sustained and strong reductions in the emissions of other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide, not necessarily down to zero, but nevertheless, very significant reductions. And if we do all of these things, then we can manage climate change to some degree and possibly even turn aspects of it around. And I think that's what we're all aiming for here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mark Howden. I think that was a very informative and great presentation into the IPCC report. Um, and there's a wide range of um, topic and messages there. Uh, thank you for the introduction to the overall structure of the IPCC assessment cycle, um, the THG emissions and the implications in terms of temperature increase. Um, and most importantly, uh, your message on the opportunities for Pacific researchers to engage in the IPCC uh, process. And also, I think that's a message that the important role of uh, SPREP in the Pacific in terms of re reducing greenhouse gas emission uh, through our work. Um, for Taitele Lava Mark, um, 
And then now we will move on to the last uh, part of our uh, webinar today, which is a uh, panel discussion. Uh, and I will now like to hand over to the technical advisor, science to services of the Pacific Climate Change Center, Miss um, Yvette Kerslake, uh, to facilitate the panel discussion. I can see that there are questions on our Q&A box. Uh, we will try and uh, address them through uh, our Q&A box, but otherwise there will be a summary uh, of the messages and uh, uh, the discussion today that will be sent out to all the participants. Uh, thank you. I now hand over to um, Yvette Chris Lake. Thank you. Hello, Albito Ofa. Can we have a round of applause for that uh, session? A manager of the Pacific Climate Change Center. Talo falaba and a warm welcome to all our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends joining us here in the Pacific Climate Change Center, as well as um, those who are joining us online. As you're all aware, our main panel objectives this afternoon or for this Talanoa session is to address a knowledge gap in the Pacific region around the work of the IPCC and to provide the most up-to-date synthesis of relevant climate change information to diverse Pacific Island audiences. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our panelists today and also acknowledging the lecture by Professor Mark Howden of Saitil Lava. You have also set the scene for our Talanoa session uh, today. Um, our panelists will be Mr. Arona Nairi. He's the director of Kulik a Cook Islands Meteorological Service. He has worked in the meteorological field for over 35 years. He is one of the most senior Pacific meteorology scientists in the region and has also served as the chair of the Pacific Meteorological Council. He has extensive experience in meteorology, uh, climate science and climate change, and has also contributed to Pacific scientific articles and publications. Can we have a round of applause for uh, uh, Mr. Arona Nairi? Our other panelist is none other than Dr. Morgan Y. Ryu. He's a natural resource and climate change adaptation specialist. He's also the coordinating lead author and IPCC working group two. He has extensive knowledge of Pacific region environment and development issues, including government structures and systems, both at the national and community level. He has over 30 years of work experience in agriculture, forestry, land use and environment, including climate change adaptation and risk resilience in Pacific region. Can I ask our audience to also have a round of applause? Um, our third panelist on my right here is Mr. Espen Ronnenberg. He is the Director of Climate Change and Environment Sustainability Program of the Pacific Community, or other known as SPC. Espen has expertise in climate change, sustainable development, as well as in-depth knowledge and understanding of the Pacific region. He has acquired through an extensive career focused on supporting Pacific Island countries and territories capacity and initiatives. Having 28 years of working experience on climate change issues in the Pacific and beyond, and also including significant involvement with international climate change negotiations since 1992. He has contributed to many scientific publications, writing several articles on climate change and sustainable development issues. Can we have a round of applause for Espen? Our next panelist is Mr. Sales Anime. He is our Meteorology and Climatology Advisor and Climate Change Resilience of SPRIP. He has worked in the meteorology field for over 20 years in Vanuatu and in SPRIP and well known by our Pacific Met directors. He is the lead focal point and secretariat in the Pacific Met Council and the Pacific uh, Met Dex Partnership. He is also support in actioning the Pacific Roadmap on Climate Services research, as well as the Pacific Islands Meteorological Strategy. We have a round of applause for Salisa. And our final panelist is Dr. Michael Gross. He's a senior research scientist from CSIRO, and his research is into climate and climate change at regional scale, including research into drivers of climate variability and projections. He is also the climate projection scientist and also the climate model evaluation and making climate projections for Pacific Island countries. We have a round of applause for our final panelists. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can see our panelists online and also um, our panelists here that are joining us 
from the Pacific Climate Change Center. Just some housekeeping matters. If we can use the Q&A function on Zoom for our questions, uh, please. And with that, I would like to proceed uh, with Dr. Morgan Wairu. Um, you have inspired a lot of us in the Pacific and as a Pacific author, if you could share your experience of being part of the IPCC expect, uh, expert group, what are some of the challenges that you face and how can Pacific scientists be more involved in the IPCC? Dr. Morgan? Yeah, thank you, uh, moderator, for the opportunity uh, provided so that I can say some of the experiences and challenges that I've uh, gone through with, IPC, with the work of IPCC. Uh, just picking up on uh, the point that you made earlier on, as well as what Mark has just shared in terms of how can we, Pacific Islanders, especially those of us uh, in the space of science and social science, as well as uh, areas re relevant to climate change, to be engaged in the IPCC process. I think this is a good example that we are doing now, right now, more of this type of outreach so that we can inform the greater Pacific audience about what IPCC is doing uh, is a, a welcome uh, activity. And also, if I can also uh, suggest that the IPCC focal points in countries, like we have some uh, Pacific Island countries who has IPCC focal points, if they can work closely or engage more with uh, some of our Pacific experts in Pacific Island academic institutions and research centers. Uh, that will also help a lot so that that engagement is ongoing and so that they can also participate in that process. And if also I can encourage some of uh, our colleagues, colleagues in the Pacific who are working uh, in the space of science, especially uh, in terms of data and uh, information collection on climate change, uh, to encourage them to do more publications because that's the only way that you can be uh, selected uh, and to be an author of the IPCC reports. And also my last point on Pacific engagement is uh, to encourage uh, Pacific experts to start as contributing authors or to become uh, chapter reviewers in those IPCC reports. So if we can start doing that, then that can bring us some visibility in this IPCC space so that we can get some of us more involved in the IPCC. Now, moving on to my experiences so far with my engagement in IPCC, uh, I find that this is a very good opportunity. It, it provides uh, the space and the, the opportunity to engage with some of the world's best experts in this space on climate change. And we exchange information, data, and we discuss issues that are relevant to the report. And that is good exposure for, the, for, for someone like me from the Pacific, who has limited interaction with some of the best experts globally. And, uh, also, it provides me the opportunity to know more about the IPC structure, its reporting system, and its assessment, because uh, that provides you the in-depth knowledge of what is required through the IPCC. And, uh, you know, just getting involved in IPCC actually brings the Pacific narrative, or especially on climate change, our stories, uh, into the Pacific, uh, into the IPCC uh, reporting uh, process. So some of my experiences that uh, I would like to share uh, during this uh, opportunity that is provided. Now, going to the challenges. Well, there are a couple of challenges that, uh, especially coming from the Pacific, uh, as we know, the IPCC work is really time consuming. Uh, it's a full time work on its own. So it's, it's really a, a struggle having a full-time job, working full-time, and then you have to do this IPCC work, which also required real uh, serious commitment from, uh, from your side. So that's something that is very challenging, having to shuttle between your job as well as working and doing the work of IPCC. Uh, one also required the support uh, of the employer, you know, having worked with 
USP and now coming back to the community, the support from the employer is very important in terms of time and resources. As well as, uh, you know, for the Pacific, one of the challenges as well is the availability of published literature. We have so many reports in uh, project reports, technical reports that are around, but it's very difficult to get the, those type of reports into the IPCC uh, reporting uh, system. So we need all information to be published and it's quite very difficult to do, to get access to those information. And just lastly, IPCC work is a volunteer thing. Uh, so it requires real commitment uh, to engage in this whole IPCC work, but it's been rewarding as far as I can uh, say during my past uh, seven years engagement with IPCC. So with that, thank you very much. And I would like to thank the audience for listening to my uh, short story on IPCC engagement. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. Can we have a round of applause for Dr. Morgan? I appreciate your insights as a Pacific author. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, uh, Arona Nari, our other panelists, had an urgent uh, government meeting that he needed to attend to. But I just wanted to share his word of uh, encouragement, just a word of encouragement to all sits. Identify a focal point for IPCC and attend these, session, these sessions. You may not know all of them, but you will learn from peers in the sessions. And always nice to see other sits in these sessions. The latest report is a bonus to all that contributed. We might not see you at COP meetings, but IPCC meetings are just as, ex as, as, as exciting. <laughs> all the best for your deliberations today. And with that, we'll lead into our next panelist, uh, Espen. Uh, the, I understand the IPCC reports inform policymakers what scientists know about climate change. What would this entail for the Pacific region for the upcoming COP26? Um, thank you, uh, Yves. Well, the basic point around this is why is this important? Why is the IPCC um, report so important to the international process? What difference can it make uh, at the international level? And what does the Pacific region uh, have to do? So I, I put together just a few slides as by way of background. But uh, the most important starting point is that the, the convention itself, uh, adopted in 1992, tells us that we have to take the best available science into account. Um, just waiting for the sharing so I can see what I wrote. Um, it tells us to take the best available science into account, but it also tells us that um, in the absence of a full scientific certainty that we should not be, uh, uh, be taking any, um, um, uh, any, any actions. So waiting to have full certainty was, was never the intention. Uh, so that that's been that was enshrined in the in the convention and the and, and the reflection of that in the process is that the IPCC presents uh, reports to to the COP to the subsidiary bodies and so on. So not uh, no, okay, yeah one more one more. And um, uh, it, there's also uh, provisions in in the convention. Um, that seeks to to um, to ensure that these uh, uncertainties, causes, effects, magnitude, and so on, that they're reduced over time, and it calls for this cooperation. So, of course, IPCC is very much in line with with the with this part of the convention. Uh, next, um, it also um, within the um, uh, within the uh, the convention text, it talks about the role of the COP, and and what the COP should be doing. And it should specifically be looking at the evolution of scientific and technical knowledge and to cooperate with competent international organizations. Um, this is the role of the COP, but it's also the work of the subsidiary body on uh, science and technological advice. Next. Uh, this was also reflected on in the Paris Agreement, um, which uh, ha has this clearly stated in its preamble, but it also has all the principles of the convention applying unless they've been specifically modified in any of the articles. Uh, next. So there are a large number of agenda items um, that are potentially affected by uh, acceptance of, of the latest science. Now, this has been covered uh, in part by uh, Professor Howden. So uh, mitigation, adaptation, of course, uh, very clear, but there's also 
a need to um, uh, to to have some of the functions under the Paris Agreement uh, maintain their environmental integrity, and they all require the latest science to inform them about this. So I'm going to use the example of markets, which is probably the most complicated one I pick. But um, if you look at the the diagram, this shows you the difference between what's going into uh, into investments and subsidies in fossil fuels, but also the costs um, that are being uh, that are being meted out on, on mostly vulnerable countries like Pacific SIDS uh, against um, the investments that are going into renewable energy and also um, uh, that are being mobilized um, un under the um, uh, uh, under the convention to, to support action in developing countries. So there's a huge imbalance. Now, um, what can the science tell us uh, that could possibly tip this scale? Well, obviously, um, the, uh, the costs of, uh, of adaptation uh, will be covered um, uh, further down, but we already have um, some indications uh, from working group one that um, we're looking at some, some severe and debilitating costs for the Pacific. And we also understand uh, from, from the science that these investments and subsidies in, in oil and gas are really, um, uh, are, are really extremely um, uh, detrimental to the overall balance and really need to be shifted to, um, to, the, uh, to the other side of the scale. So next, please. Um, this is a, um, a diagram, uh, this is a second diagram, thank, thank you to climate analytics, but this, this, uh, this gets at uh, the global mitiga mitigation ambition gap. And again, this is where um, the, uh, the point that was raised earlier about um, commitments already in place under the Paris Agreement will not get us um, get us where we want to be. Uh, some of the revised targets that have come out are helpful, but again, they are not. Um, uh, they are not going to get us where we need to be. So, um, using um, the markets function of the Paris Agreement, there is a potential for some of this gap, at least, to be closed. We have a, a functionality of the the overall mitigation of global emissions, uh, a cancellation of a percentage of uh, of emissions in all trades. Uh, there is also uh, the the share of proceeds, of course, going towards. Uh, uh, going towards um, uh, adaptation uh, to help offset some of those damages caused by uh, by greenhouse gas emissions already emitted, but uh, from from this you can see that there is a potential for for a functional and environmentally um, sustainable market mechanism can actually help contribute to bringing uh, this uh, ambition gap into closure. Uh, the alternative, though, is if we are not informed well by the science, uh, if we allow some of these loopholes that uh, certain countries are asking for uh, to, to uh, be permitted, then uh, that contribution will, will not be effective at all. Uh, next. Uh, so um, we've, we've seen over the years um, that uh, the science has been largely trampled on by, by a certain group of countries. I think the second assessment report was the last one to actually be accepted. Uh, the third assessment report, which was released around the Kyoto conference, um, that, was, that was really uh, the start of this process uh, of sowing doubts about the science, uh, whether all regions had been properly accounted for, uh, some of the things that, um, um, that have, have been now fully put to rest, such as the short-lived uh, carbon uh, pollutants and so on. Uh, but there is this trend that um, certain countries will seek to ensure that the reports are, are not um, endorsed, that they are not noted, but that is something that is very important uh, for, for the Pacific uh, coming up at COP and beyond. So next. Um, so ideally, um, um, the work of IPCC should be endorsed in the prime decision, uh, which is uh, always referred to as dec decision one and then the COP number. Um, since we don't have the full sixth assessment report, um, uh, such an endorsement might not uh, be possible, but at least uh, we, could all, we, could, uh, we could seek that for the special reports that have already been, uh, um, been approved. And there's a need to have references to, to this latest science in a number of different fields, um, such as uh, finance, uh, linking the science to the impacts and costs, but also the need to, to invest in renewable energy through increasing ambition in NDCs, et cetera, uh, getting the technology and the capacity building 
uh, up and running. And, and to highlight Morgan's point uh, on research and systematic observation, uh, as well as the education, training and awareness, we need more support uh, to PSA science scientists and for outreach and awareness. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Espen, and round of applause for Exit Ed. Thank you once again for highlighting the importance of the IPCC 6AR to COP26. And I, specifically the example on carpet markets was very interesting, um, especially the treatment of IPCC uh, at COP. Um, and with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing very well with time. I can see there's a lot of questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we will uh, certainly answer these on live. Uh, we have two more panelists um, with us today. And with that, um, uh, Salesa Nime, if you could elaborate on the role of the Pacific Meteorological Back Desk and how this relates to the IPCC recent fundings. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Yvette, and uh, thank you, Mark, uh, Professor Houghton, for the uh, for the really wonderful presentation. I think to uh, to start the role of the Pacific Met Desk, um, I th we are the Secretariat for uh, the Pacific Meteorological uh, Council, and I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our chair, uh, the CEO for MNRI, uh, Madam um, uh, Rupena. Uh, who is the current chair of this uh, of this council? And under the council, uh, we have a strategic plan that guides the work that we do. And uh, climate change science is one of our top priorities that we ensure, um, especially for the science around the uh, the, the, the the Pacific. And we uh, we work together to advocate uh, advocate around that. Uh, just to mention that the Secretariat uh, is made up of a team here at SPREP and also the World Meteorological Council, uh, World uh, Meteorological Organization that provides support uh, to all the MET services around the region. Uh, we've developed a uh, climate change science and services research uh, roadmap, uh, hopefully to guide the work that we do in the region, especially in the area of climate change uh, uh, research. The other point that I'd like to uh, to make is the importance of the Pacific Med Council in providing strategic uh, direction and um, and also guidance uh, in the region. Uh, in a number of um, in a number of sessions that we've had, a number of meetings, uh, we've invited the IPCC to attend uh, this meeting, and um, I'm I'm also happy to say that uh, the current chair of the IPCC attended one of our meetings that we had in Tonga uh, in 2015, and through this process, uh, the Met services are, are informed of the process in ensuring that uh, they are uh, they are able to participate. As you are all aware. In most countries, the MET services are the focal points uh, for, uh, for, for the IPCC. And, and in these meetings, uh, the IPCC and also the elite authors have made the point that uh, uh, the fact that the research is quite low and the point that Morgan had raised earlier. Uh, so under the council, uh, they have formed uh, various expert panels uh, to try and look and, um, and guide the work in the various priority areas of the Pacific Island Meteorological Strategy. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, panel, uh, expert panel, is around education, training, and research. And this panel is chaired by um, the director of Cook Islands, Arona, who is not able to be here with us. Uh, but also in this panel, it has uh, participation from universities, from uh, lead research organizations. And one of our very important partner in this process is uh, CSIRO in, uh, in Australia. Uh, one, of the work, one of the work that we have done um, uh, as part of the panel is working together with different uh, funding agencies uh, to bring together all the uh, uh, universities, regional universities and also national universities uh, together with our scientific partners in the region uh, to start the process on, of engaging uh, some of our scientists in, in, in the region in terms of research. I, I am I'm hoping that this process started last year, and I'm hoping that some of the research that came out from that, uh, um, that group were able to be, um, uh, uh, to be featured in the IPCC Working Group 1, but I'm sure a, a lot of it will be featured in the IPCC Working Group, uh, working, uh, working group uh, 2. I think one of the challenges when it comes to uh, the IPCC report, countries would often uh, require uh, specific country information. 
on how the countries are impacted by climate change. Uh, and this is work that we've done together um, uh, uh, with, in collaboration with CSIRO, who have uh, provided a lot of good information that guided a lot of the negotiations in the region uh, under the PAXA project. And I understand CSIRO also in collaboration with uh, SPREP uh, is undertaking to update the science uh, for us in the Pacific and, and linking it to the uh, IPCC uh, 6 uh, report. And uh, I leave Michael to speak more on some of the work that CSIRO is doing. Uh, but just to end that, um, uh, a lot of the, especially the extreme events that uh, are highlighted in the report, uh, in the last PMC meeting, uh, council, uh, council members have foreseen uh, that there will be a challenge in terms of the capacity of the MET services and the capacity of the region in dealing with uh, extreme events that will be brought about by climate change. Uh, a, a, an investment plan has been uh, developed uh, called the Weather Ready Pacific Decadal Program of Investment uh, that was uh, put together by, uh, by the Pacific Met Council and presented to uh, the Pacific Island Leaders Forum by the government of Tonga. And happy to say that this, uh, um, uh, this framework or vision has been endorsed by the Pacific leaders and hopefully that will put us in a, a, a front foot in terms of how do we address uh, these extreme events and how do we build the capacity to be able to, uh, to tackle this. Uh, so on that, thank you very much. Uh, back to you. Thank you, Salisa. Can we have a round of applause for Salisa and also appreciate sharing uh, your insights on the meteorological metrics and also how it relates to the recent IPCC recent findings. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I would like to, uh, as Salisa has also mentioned, uh, I would also like to uh, invite now uh, Dr. Michael Gross. Uh, uh, you have been involved in the IPCC process, uh, we understand. Um, could you inform the audience of the role of uh, CSIRO, not only in the IPCC process, but also its role in the Pacific? Hello, Falafa. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. So I was a lead author on the ATLAS chapter in the Working Group 1 IPCC report. Uh, it also features an interactive atlas for the first time, which is uh, an online website where you can view climate projections, past trends and other information in an interactive, engaging way. So I encourage everyone to uh, jump online and have a look at that. Uh, it, it's a little bit technical, so it takes a little while to come up to speed on some details, but uh, I think, uh, you know, just have a play around and see how you go. It's hopefully a very useful feature. Um, I, was, I was also a contributor to Chapter 1, 10, 11 and 12, and Chapter 10, 11 and 12 are, have that regional focus. So in the context of the, the global climate change, people are also obviously very interested in what it means for the region and ideally for their country. Uh, and so each of those chapters has a regional focus and there's more regional focus than ever uh, in the IPCC assessment compared to previous versions. Uh, there's also a regional fact sheet for the small islands as well. So uh, that's a, another useful resource. However, the report can't be uh, an replacement or a, 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 the equivalent of a regional scale climate service or, or, or climate uh, information at a country scale. It just can't do that for every country. So the, the regions used in most of the report are quite large. So it reports on the South Pacific, the Equatorial Pacific and the North Pacific, which obviously are very big regions. Um, some places goes into more detail at the subscales than that, such as to the south of the South Pacific Convergence Zone or the Northwest Pacific, where there's particular uh, issues of interest uh, in those smaller regions. But still, that's uh, a much bigger scale than what a lot of people are interested in, especially when it comes to looking at questions of planning and adaptation to the climate change that we will experience over the coming decades. Um, we want to know what happens to, you, to the, each area specifically and then bring to that together with local knowledge, local data sets uh, and local information to, to understand what it means and then what to do about it. So Working Group 2 um, report, which will be due out uh, next year, will go into a lot more detail 
bringing together those different aspects of exposure vulnerability with climate change, uh, but still it will not be a replacement for local and regional uh, climate um, information, knowledge and services. So at CSIRO in Australia, and also the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, uh, we've been very fortunate to work together with SPREP and MET agencies over a long period of time uh, on projects that complement and add to things like the IPCC assessment report uh, in terms of um, working with um, MET services on, on data sets, uh, data rescue and so on. And I know uh, Simon is online, uh, who's involved in that, that area as well from Australia. Uh, and also looking at evaluating and assessing the climate modeling that's done uh, and how it relates to the Pacific and looking at climate projections uh, for the Pacific Ocean specifically and our partner countries in the Pacific. And this is where we can go in a little bit more detail compared to what's in the IPCC report. Uh, uh, and report on country level um, issues and, uh, and case studies, as well as changes at, at that scale. Uh, so perhaps um, to leave us lots of time for the questions that people are asking in the chat, maybe I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gross. Can we have a round of applause and thank you for your insights on the interactive atlas, but also um, linked to the country uh, specific reports, which um, we will have a separate uh, webinar on this uh, to inform our audience. Um, so now, ladies and gentlemen, it brings us to our Q&A questions. We have a lot of interesting questions. Uh, if you would allow me to uh, read the first question. Uh, very interesting one. You mentioned a need to engage far more from the region. What are the reasons for the low interaction when we are so much in the political leadership for climate justice globally? Also, do the panelists have specific strategies to ensure that this, these changes, as it is so urgent to have SIDS overall and diverse Pacific Islands, Islanders climate, and I include scientific leadership, including of women, people with disabilities, young people, elders, urban, poor, rural, and maritime communities. Uh, with that, may I ask uh, Professor Mark Holden and um, also Dr. Uh, Morgan also touched on this, uh, if you could answer. Look, um, so thanks very much, Yvette. And um, so it's a really good question. So I, I guess I'd, I'd start by framing the IPCC is that it is a scientific synthesis and assessment. So, and, and Morgan did touch on this in his earlier response, is that um, the, the material um, that needs to be pulled together in the IPCC uh, is essentially published material, either through um, the peer-reviewed journal uh, information or through some of the grey literature, such as reports from agencies. And, um, and so, so there is a, a, a sort of a process and, and, a, and a type of material which is accessible to IPCC. Um, and that's because it's really important from a quality control perspective to ensure that um, material that gets into the IPCC is uh, you know, robust and appropriate. Um, in terms of uh, engagement more broadly across civil society, um, I actually think that probably needs to happen outside of IPCC. So that's that's a, a not an intergovernmental process. I think that's that becomes essentially a political process. Um, sometimes local politics and sometimes national and global politics, uh, depending on the uh, you know the, the participants and the forums that you're engaging in. Um, but I do think it is really important to. Um, look in the future to increasingly engage across the Pacific with IPCC processes. So as, as Morgan said, that means um, ensuring that there's a good publication base and a good information base from which the IPCC can, can uh, um, you know, draw from to, to synthesize information, um, that there's capacity building across the, IPC, uh, across the Pacific so that there's a, a really strong pool of people who can engage not just in the scientific process, but also in the governmental processes of IPCC, such as what Arona does, which is uh, turning up to um, the IPCC plenaries and uh, bureau meetings uh, to have input into um, key decisions which are made in terms of the IPCC. And, and I think uh, all, all up, there's, there's also an important part of really just being very visible um, in the science community so people know who you are um, and so that uh, 
you know, when we're going through selection processes, uh, that people are a known quantity, um, and so that it, it makes an easier pathway for um, choice in terms of uh, author teams, etc. Because those choices are incredibly complex. Uh, there's about eight different dimensions uh, of, of selection process that need to be satisfied to actually put someone on an author team, like as a lead author or convening lead author. So we've got to, you know, take take into account um, national level, um, sort of regional representation, gender um, representation, disciplinary uh, balance, um, and various other things. And so, so just making sure that um, there's a really great pool of, of Pacific um, candidates for selection within IPCC processes is, I think, a really good start. Thanks, Professor Mark. I'm Dr. Morgan. Yes, thank you. If I may just add to what Mark has just said, uh, as you all well aware, uh, IPCC reports are, are robust and credible, and therefore they rely on uh, good published materials. And uh, I'm very aware that there have been a lot of good things happening in the Pacific, you know, inclusive of men, women, uh, youth, you know, informing the climate change uh, adaptation uh, work, as well as other activities that are related to climate change. But most of these things are, are actually there in technical reports or just project reports or just people writing uh, uh, news paper, press release articles, they all really need to come into a format that is publishable. And the onus is on a specific islanders to really sit down and write uh, those papers so that we can generate and push them out into the, the, the scientific community for uh, their readership as well as to be inclusive in the IPCC process. And uh, that's something that uh, I still like to emphasize that uh, for Pacific Islanders and experts, we really need to step up and start doing those work, as well as just adding on to what Mark has said as well. We also need to be engaged in that whole IPCC process so that uh, we know the process and the structure so that we can be engaged constructively. So that's a, a small piece from me on that particular question. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, we also have some reflections from the floor. Yes, ben? Yeah, thanks. The uh, first point, just to reiterate what M Morgan said earlier about um, uh, the, the need to, if you are going to be part in this process, you, you have to, have, it's a big commitment, it takes a lot of time. If you're going to be uh, in, in one of the, the working groups, if you're contributing, if you're a reviewer, it does take up a lot of your time. Even writing um, uh, is time consuming and it, it may interfere with your day job. Uh, um, as it were, but uh, there, there was an effort done uh, recently by by Salesa and the team uh, to bring together um, um, people working in, in meteorology and, and climate science in the region and trying to assist them in getting their uh, their work published. Uh, so that's an example of, of of what can be done. But again, it, it's it, it it it's a commitment not just from from those individuals but also from their employers. Uh, to give them the time to uh, to uh, to be able to do that, but uh, it, it was an example where where um, where there were mentors involved in in helping uh, Pacific Island scientists and and meteorologists and so on uh, get their papers um, uh, into a publishing um, into the publishing sphere. Thank you. Thank you, Espen, and that leads us to our second question. With the effects from COVID lockdowns or restrictions with diminished anthropogenic emissions, how much change, if any, do you foresee in climate model output? Also, are you able to rank which countries emit most um, carbon dioxide? I would like to ask uh, Professor Mark and then maybe uh, Dr. Michael Gross, if you could also answer. Yeah, um, thanks, Yvette. That's again, a really good question. So when uh, COVID struck and there was really significant reductions in economic activity, um, we saw both a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, that was around about 7% across the globe for last year. Uh, but we also saw um, re significant reductions in air pollution, um, particularly across Asia and Southeast Asia and, uh, and, and South Asia. And so um, essentially these have countervailing sort of influences. Um, so, so reducing uh, our, our greenhouse um, gas emissions um, tends to reduce warming in a very small part, 
way. But um, reducing that pollution actually tends to increase warming. So because those pollutants tend to cool the climate. And, uh, and so, so there's a net element there which, um, which has to be calculated. So far, we've seen no influence of that lockdown um, in terms of global temperatures, nor in terms of global carbon dioxide concentration. So, so it's too small to really show up amongst the noise um, of the global systems. But if we did this year on year on year, um, then we would start to see those, those influences start to accumulate. And so, um, so just one little uh, reduction in, uh, you know, a 7% you know, reduction for one year or two years um, is probably not enough to really make much difference to anything. And in fact, to put that in context, um, that reduction in greenhouse gas emissions last year essentially buys us three and a half weeks of time before we exceed 1.5 degrees at current rates of emissions. So, so essentially it buys us no time at all um, uh, in terms of delaying climate change. Um, in terms of uh, ranking countries, there's, there's lots of resources on the web uh, which actually do that sort of country by country ranking in terms of individual greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, but also across the whole basket of greenhouse gases and, and so, you know, for example, China is the single biggest uh, emitter of greenhouse gases uh, currently. Um, but, uh, but also you can see uh, analyses of the per capita um, greenhouse gas emissions, which is, gives you a very different priority list. Um, but you can also see, um, you know, lists of uh, greenhouse gas emissions per unit GDP and various other criteria. So depending on what your question is, you can find resources which can inform uh, discussions uh, quite easily on the web. Thank you, Professor Mark. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Michael? Thanks, Red, and thanks, Professor Hold uh, Holden has answered that really very well. I just thought I'd add one other extra kind of piece of information that's perhaps not in the report, but is, is relevant to interpret uh, these results. And that is uh, a kind of a crisis like COVID-19 with enforced lockdowns and so on only got us a 7% reduction for a single year, which doesn't make a big impact on the uh, cumulative emissions since pre-industrial. But this doesn't mean that's not what following a low emissions pathway into the future has to look like. So reducing our emissions and restructuring our economy and, and moving to a low carbon or a no carbon economy doesn't have to look like COVID-19 lockdowns. Uh, it's a different kind of uh, exercise to, to make the reductions that we need to do to get onto a low emission scenario uh, than the pain of a crisis like COVID-19. So don't think of those as the same thing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Um, our next question, uh, another interesting question, is that the information in these reports is crucial and of great quality, but the world does not hear us. The world does not want to hear or admit the disasters and risks involved. We can only admit that we are failing to communicate, to raise awareness, and to encourage change. We have the information. How do we make the changes without scaring, but giving hope and desire? Um, um, I'll ask um, Professor Mark uh, if you can address this question as well, and then I can also invite uh, Salesa on your awareness um, um, and, and, and community awareness. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, look, I, I think what this does is it provides us the understanding that allows us to make better informed decisions, and, and that's the crucial thing here. Um, clearly, some of the scenarios are really scary and concerning. Um, but there's also other scenarios which do offer some indication of hope. And, and, and I emphasize that how there are scenarios which turn around uh, the climate change. And, 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 I, and I think that's a really important thing because if there is no hope, um, people turn off and they don't engage and they don't act in ways which can ultimately resolve the problem. I think one of the things that, that um, Michael Gross just raised, which is you know, the lessons from the coronavirus lockdown and one of those is that we can actually make um, really big changes very rapidly in many economies across the world um, in response to, you know, a crisis. And, uh, and importantly, many countries have had a significant reliance on expert advice and scientific information in terms of their response to coronavirus. 
with demonstrably positive effects. So those countries which responded well, which looked after their people, so had a public health focus, are also those countries which have done very well economically, which have suffered relatively little out of the coronavirus epidemic. Those countries which let it rip have actually suffered very seriously. And it's a couple of important things. One is that that information, good scientific information, generated good outcomes for people and for our economy, for our livelihoods. Those countries which ignored that scientific information didn't do so well. So that's a really important sign. It it also tells us, I think, about how we make decisions. And and importantly, um, what we're getting in climate change is a whole stack of other factors coming into decision making rather than just the science. Now, this is fine. That's an important part of policy. But it seems to me that what's happened is the science and the public voice has been marginalised in those decisions to an extent that is problematic in terms of generating good outcomes for our nations. Thank you, Professor Park. May I invite Salisa and then um, Espen? Yeah, okay. yeah just, uh, just adding that um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not only uh, that our forces are not hurt, but uh, but also that we are already facing the realities of uh, these changes. You would recall um, in the last few years, we've been impacted by uh, a lot of uh, uh, very strong tropical cyclones in the region, which, which affected our communities. And, and that uh, is a sign of uh, climate change already uh, at our doorsteps. But I think uh, in terms of voice, our voices not being heard, I think has been uh, being part of the international negotiations would be able to share some light on the voices from the Pacific. Thanks. I think the Pacific it has played a very strong role in, in, in bringing this message forward, but uh, also, I guess, the, uh, there has been uh, some changes in the last uh, 10, 15 years, perhaps, in that um, the reports that we've been getting, not just from the IPCC, but also from other intergovernmental agencies, have shown that there is some hope, that there, there, there's large potential in green jobs. Uh, both the International Energy Agency and the uh, International Labour Organization recently put out some, some papers on this. So, so there is um, a, a lot of potential for, for having what is now being referred to as a, as a just transition from a fossil fuel, industry, uh, fossil fuel economy to, to a greener economy. And, and technologies are being uh, being uh, adapted uh, so that they fit to different sizes of countries. This has been a big problem for for, for island countries that the applications have been uh, for countries that are much larger than us, have much larger populations, and so on. Uh, there are new techniques that are being 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 uh, tested. Um, I was uh, intrigued to see that um, um, a report from the International Maritime Organization about the use of uh, uh, pure ammonia as a fuel additive. And, and what that, that did to reduce emissions, uh, that frankly surprised me a lot. Um, so there is this hope out there, and, 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 um, uh, but there are some countries or some negotiators simply do, simply do not want to accept this or do not want to, to see this. Um, and uh, that also, you know, the point is, why should it be the role of, uh, of island countries to point out to the big emitters uh, what technologies and techniques they need to uh, adopt in order to reduce their emissions. They have much more resources than us, but certainly I think there, is, there has been a shift in, 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 in not being all uh, doom and gloom, but rather pointing to these international reports saying, look, if all these international experts are telling us that there is possibilities, and I guess this is something that, uh, that may come up uh, quite strongly in working group three, but it was certainly there in the 1.5 report when, when we got to the discussion around, well, is 1.5 feasible? And, and I, th- I think the answer was, yes, it is, but it needs that political will. And unfortunately, that's missing in a number of quarters. Thank you. Thank you, Espen. Uh, we have a very specific uh, question here. Maybe Professor Howden, uh, you'll be able to answer it. I have two questions about aerosol cooling. Is aerosol cooling uniform throughout the planet? Do some parts of the planet experience it more than others? Uh, Professor Mark. Yeah, um, there, there's, there's a really strong sort of concentration uh, with uh, aerosol cooling and, and pollutants. Um, particularly in East Asia and Southeast Asia, um, less so 
uh, if you um, go to um, Europe and, and North America, because they've, they've had programs to reduce air pollution significantly going back to the 70s and 80s, um, and very little of that happening over um, the Southern Hemisphere. And so um, there is a, a very strong sort of concentration of um, that sort of pollutant-based cooling in, in that those parts of Asia. And, and that was where under the COVID lockdown, where there was uh, you know, greatly reduced, uh, say, transport, um, that was where all of a sudden people actually could see the Himalayas from parts of India where they'd never actually seen them in a whole lifetime, uh, simply because the air was, was much cleaner than it had ever, ever been before. And so um, that just tells you how pervasive um, uh, some of that pollutant pollution is in those regions. Uh, and of course, that's linked with economic development uh, and it's linked with taking people out of poverty, but it does generate very, very substantial health outcomes as well as impacting on global climate. Thank you, Professor Howden. Uh, our next question is, according to the AR6, the mean sea level rise under the lowest emission is scenario is projected to be 0 0.5 meters. Some modeling, example uh, NOAA, predict a SLR of one meter for RMI, for example. What would you attribute the huge difference in the projections? Uh, this would obviously impact on planning and adaptation responses to sea level rise. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Baiko Gross and then also uh, Saleh Satu answer this question. Sure, thanks very much. So there's various contributions to sea level rise. There's just as water becomes warmer, it expands and that leads to sea level rise. There's also uh, melting glaciers contribute water into the sea and that leads to sea level rise. There's also the, the large ice sheets, which is Greenland in the north and Antarctica to the south. And all of these things contribute to sea level rise in different amounts. As we move into the future, there's more and more contribution from the big ice sheets at Greenland and Antarctica. And this one is a little bit less certain than the thermal expansion and the glaciers um, that we have a really good quantitative handle on what, they, what they're likely to do under those different scenarios. Antarctica, especially the West Antarctic ice sheet and Greenland may continue melting at a smooth, steady rate, or they may you know, accelerate or collapse. And that's what could lead to that, that worst case scenario under the high emissions scenario that, uh, that, Mark, that Professor Howden uh, portrayed. Um, and so for each of the scenarios, there's a likely range given in the projection, in the, in the, uh, in the report, a likely global range. It's very different in different parts of the world as well. Some places it raises, it rises greater, uh, more faster than the global average, some places less. But then there's also uh, not only that likely range, but then there's also this possibility of, of uh, changes outside that likely range. And the other thing about sea level, unlike things like uh, temperature change, uh, is projected to just continue on long after the 21st century, even if um, we do uh, stabilise the climate. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Just one addition from me uh, uh, to that, and that's also attributed to land movement, uh, which can also affect uh, sea level uh, rise. And I know the project that DFAT, a uh, very long term project that DFAT is funding under COSPAC uh, that uh, has a sea level monitoring network around the region. And they are also uh, monitoring the land movement as part of this project uh, to better understand um the the different rates of sea level uh, in, in 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 the pacific thank you sally so we have a, a specific question for professor mark the emissions budget and likelihood approach from your last slide gives some wiggle room to major emitters but it's likely to represent unacceptable risk to the pacific if sufficient conservatism is not applied how can we best focus the action efforts if a carbon budget budget approach is taken to make sure that the probability uncertainty is not used to justify exceeding budgets? Yeah, th thanks, Yvette. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, the way I'd see it is the carbon budget approach is essentially a, um, a, a simple tool or, or a mechanism to, to engage people and understanding. So it's a communication tool rather than a decision-making tool. So, so decision-making tools are, are much more about um, 
uh, formal greenhouse gas inventories, um, which are run by nations and in some countries are required to be run by companies, for example, um, as part of their approaches. Um, it's embedded into things like uh, emissions trading systems. And, and so those are the, the formal tools with which um, decisions uh, perhaps need to be made. I think the strength of the carbon budget um, approach um, is not its precision or whether it gives wriggle room or not. It's actually a mechanism to increase understanding and send the message of urgency that we, if we keep on doing what we're doing, we haven't got very much time to act before we end up in future climates that we're really concerned about. So differentiating between a communication device, the carbon budgets, and actual decision-making advice, which is actually about developing greenhouse gas inventories and the various policy mechanisms which can generate change in greenhouse emissions. Thank you, Professor Howden. Our next uh, question or comment is, uh, thank you, Mark and Sprit, for hosting this important session. I am interested in what consideration there has been around traditional knowledge feeding into, informing, and validating the IPCC reports. Uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Professor Mark Holden and also uh, Salesa for this question. Yeah, and, and, and also I think it'd be good to bring Morgan into this discussion and as well. But, but increasingly over IPCC reports over time, we've seen more inclusion of uh, you know, different disciplinary bases. So inclusion of history. Um, and so there's authors who deal with that. Inclusion of social psychology, um, authors who deal with that. And also um, people who engage uh, on um, traditional and indigenous and local knowledge. And so in this particular IPCC cycle, not so much in working group one, but more in working group two, and to some extent working group three, we've seen a greater inclusion of Indigenous, local and traditional knowledge as part of um, the uh, assessment process. But as Morgan uh, made a point earlier, um, that information needs to be documented um, in some way in the scientific literature um, so that it is, in a sense, accessible and referenceable by the IPCC. Um, so there is definitely an understanding um, that we need to bring those different types of knowledge into the discussions and into the solution space, the adaptation space particularly, because that's absolutely crucial um, because adaptation is so contextual. Um, but but it's, it's a start. I don't think we're there yet in terms of full inclusion, but I think is, there's a recognition that it needs to be part of the IPCC process. Thank you, Professor Mark. Um, and I invite um, Dr. Morgan. Yeah, just to add to uh, Mark's uh, statement there, yeah, there have been increasing uh, recognition of the local as well as traditional knowledge in the IPCC recently. And uh, we, we've been specifically asked by the IPCC to really uh, you know, look at whatever no local knowledge or traditional knowledge is available to inform uh, the report. And most of this you can find in the working group, group two report that is coming out in, in February. Uh, but still, uh, we were not able to get as much as we have hoped for to, to get all that information. And uh, still, there is opportunity and room for more of that to inform the IPCC report in the future. But uh, definitely, there is strong uh, recognition within IPCC to include such local and traditional knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, Salesa, would you want to elaborate on your work with traditional knowledge? Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. So we have a project uh, in the Pacific that looks specifically at traditional knowledge uh, uh, on weather, uh, weather and uh, uh, climate indicators. And this project is funded by uh, Government of Australia to uh, SPREP and also the Australian Bureau of, of Meteorology. And um, uh, this is looking at um, uh, different indicators that are continually changing. Uh, or some might be changing due to, uh, due to climate change. But uh, the important thing is uh, this, um, uh, under this work, there's been, there's been quite a few papers that have already been uh, been published. As, as you men mentioned, uh, Morgan, this is quite a very new uh, new area and to make sure that we have some literature uh, captured. Uh, I know under the 
under the under the panel there is currently a paper that is being worked on by uh, universities and different institutions to try and put together a a paper on traditional knowledge and and, and climate change science uh, but uh, it's it's really good that it's coming across as a uh, from the IPCC that is something uh, uh, that they are recognizing the the value in the knowledge of uh, based with our communities. Thank you, Salisa. Our next question is specific to Dr. Morgan. When you're referring uh, to reports to be pub published, do you mean peer review academic journal publications? Yes, and that's the first part of call for any assessment. We always call for peer reviewed uh, uh, journals, articles within those uh, publications that, but you know, there are exceptions, but uh, we always seek the, the guidance of the IPCC Bureau. If we are, do include other literature apart from peer-reviewed uh, published journals. Thanks, Dr. Morgan. And um, there's also another question specifically for you. Very interesting. I'm just wondering, what are the eligibility criteria for being the IPCC focal point? Yeah, I, I think Mark will be best person to answer that question since he's uh, yeah. in the role of chair of the IPCC Bureau. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, focal points are actually governmental positions. Um, so they're, they're positions which are actually decided by governments um, and, and allocated by governments. So um, but there are no um, hard and fast rules as to who is chosen by governments to be the focal point. So, so sometimes it may be someone in a meteorological agency. Um, sometimes it may be, uh, you know, someone in a, a, a major department, um, you know, a governmental department. So, so for example, in, in, uh, in Australia, um, the IPCC focal point uh, is a, a very senior public servant who, who works in the Department of, of Science uh, in the climate change domain there. So in charge of the climate change division. And, uh, and and that, that's a, a focal point because, of course, there's other people working on climate change who work to that person um, who are actively engaged or more actively engaged in the IPCC process itself. But, but the focal point's a really important thing, um, uh, position, because it can act as a, a really significant conduit of information into IPCC as well as out of IPCC. And, uh, and in many countries where that um, focal point job um, comes on top of often existing quite complex jobs where people have many different roles. Um, it can often get squeezed out. And so, so there's very little time to, to pay attention to that. Um, and so, so that, I guess that's the reality of, of, uh, of um, you know, when you've got constrained resources. Um, but, uh, you know, within this IPCC cycle, um, as, as a group of vice chairs, um, the vice chair from Indonesia, Malaysia, New Zealand, Australia, um, we've, we've actually tried to engage with IPCC vocal, focal points across the Pacific, but unfortunately many of the email addresses, et cetera, were non-functional. So the, the, the actual contact points that were registered with the IPCC um, weren't active and we couldn't actually contact the focal points. So there is a real need to you know, upgrade that and so that there's uh, enhanced ability to, to communicate across the Pacific. Thank you, Professor Mark. Um, also, thank you to all our audiences for the questions. Unfortunately, uh, we've now gone over time, uh, but please be advised that we will answer all your questions um, online and also to thank you all for your questions. Also acknowledging um, the patients as well as our audience um, in the PCC climate change. Uh, thank you also for your questions, which we will um, answer later. And um, with that, I'll just um, summarize uh, our discussions today, also acknowledging our amazing uh, panelists and also our lecturer by Professor Bach, if we can have a round of applause for our panelists. And um, just, uh, just a summary remark from me is that we are all now aware that the IPCC 6 assessment report is the latest set of IPCC reports that assess the scientific knowledge on climate change including our past, present, and future, its impacts and future risk and options for adaptation and mitigation. 
And uh, please note that uh, we will provide a summary of the discussions. And we'll also send uh, the link of the Zoom uh, recording, also acknowledging our IT team who are here with us today in clubs and uh, knowledge management. We'll also send a link to the evaluation uh, survey. We'll put it in the chat box, but we'll also answer this and we'll like to hear from, from you on this webinar. And also there would also be another series of webinars uh, based on your feedback. And with that, I would like to hand over to Ms. Ofa uh, for your summary remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Yvette and our distinguished panelists. Uh, I thought that was a really good Q&A session and also presentations from um, our uh, panelists today. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, give this opportunity to the Director General of uh, SPREP, uh, Dr. Kosila, to, to please deliver the uh, closing remarks for our session today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ofa. And, uh... Thank you, Yvette, uh, for uh, doing an excellent job of moderating our panelists, um, panel. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank all of our panelists. Thank you so much for your contribution this afternoon. Uh, it's been uh, very useful and I found it, personally myself, uh, an extremely timely uh, discussion, particularly as we lead up to COP26. Uh, I recall... Uh, um, it's been making the point about um, the importance of what uh, the AR6 uh, uh, speaks about, particularly as we lead up to um, COP26 and considering the key issues that are going to be discussed. I, I, I certainly hope that that will be something that will feature very much in the negotiations. So uh, that's something to be seen. Um, can I acknowledge also the CEO of uh, MNRE? Thank you very much, Francis. I know you've been sitting there patiently listening to the discussions as well and to all of our distinguished representatives from the member countries, our partners and, and everyone that's present. Um, I, I, I didn't have too much to, to uh, say by way of closing, but just uh, I think what we've heard today really uh, reinforces the fact that uh, there is an urgent need for us to work with particularly the big emitting countries because uh, um, we need for them to come on board. We need for them to take uh, urgent and, and uh, critical action in order for us to meet um, you know, the targets of the Paris Agreement, particularly the 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius temperature limit. Um, and we also heard today that uh, the time is, is uh, for us to do something is, is now very, very small and uh, we need to, the window of opportunity is very small and we need to really um, uh, up, uh, work quickly and urgently. Um, I think uh, it's not just, it's not us that need to be uh, convinced. I think it's, we're talking about the global community and particularly uh, members of the global community that need to uh, take the action that's needed for us. Uh, to avoid the most adverse impacts of climate change. Um, let me acknowledge again our panelists and thank you to our partner uh, ANU uh, and also um, everybody that's uh, been able to make time to uh, attend this webinar. You've heard from Yvette that uh, there is a, a plan to have a series of IPCC webinars in the near future. So I'm sure you'll be hearing from Ofa and and the team. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, you've also heard from Yvette about our evaluation survey and summary. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say, but uh, let me close by saying thank you very much again uh, for your participation and particularly enlightening us again on the importance uh, or the important messages of the AR6 report that we've heard today. So with those uh, closing remarks, uh, uh, thank you. Have a great uh, afternoon, and we look forward to seeing all of you in the next uh, series of webinars. Thank you. Mm. Thank you.